Many people are searching for their purpose. However, in living their lives, most people don't find their purpose, and some don't even think about it at all. What is the most important purpose of fundamental science? The answer is simple. Fundamental science is obliged to provide mankind with a certain knowledge, the use of which will allow him to survive in space under any circumstances. It should be clear that we're also talking about the survival of the human species in the event that for some reason the planet becomes uninhabitable. Few people think about the fact that space, although it seems empty, is a treacherous wilderness. There's harsh radiation in the event of a supernova from a nearby star, there's giant asteroids, there could be alien invasions, black holes, and much more that we can't even fathom. If fundamental science is obligated to provide humanity with knowledge that will allow us to survive even if the planet becomes unlivable, then it is legitimate to ask, is the kind of knowledge now proclaimed by the scientific community as the only correct one, capable of providing the human species with, if not relative safety, at least survival? The answer here is unequivocal. No, the available knowledge lacks the necessary depth. Survival in outer space will at least require fundamentally new forms of propulsion as well as resourceless ways of obtaining energy. Neither the first nor the second is offered by fundamental science. And to make matters worse, they go as far as to say that it is anti-science, pseudoscience. Then is it fundamental science at all? Are the people at the helm of this science? Motion takes place at all levels of the organization of matter. For this reason, motion is a key fundamental property of this world. However, in modern physics, this property is considered to be beyond deep understanding. But what about the question of the processes that participate in and form the movement of bodies in space? Here, it's enough for modern physics to assert that motion is a property of the surrounding world, which does not need an explanation in and of itself. But what did our scientific forefathers say? For example, Aristotle, who lived long before the inception of modern mathematics. He said, the knowledge of motion inevitably entails the knowledge of nature. In other words, our level of depth of understanding of the processes which trigger the appearance of motion are directly related to our level of understanding of all natural phenomenon. Therefore, the cognition of motion is our goal. But let's take everything in its proper order. We must first begin with the dependence of the length of a standing wave on the velocity of the system in which that wave is realized. Until the age of about 27, I was as ordinary as anyone, uninterested in solving nature's riddles. But in 1981, I suddenly became the only person on planet Earth who knew about the dependence of the length of a standing wave on the speed of the system in which this standing wave was occurring in. At that time, I was 29. Suddenly my eyes were opened for the first time, and I saw something that was previously inaccessible. Since then my life has changed radically. This is where I had my Eureka moment, in a trophy German mansion in an attic room. I decided to inform the scientific community of the USSR. I visited several specialized institutes and also applied to the Academy of Sciences. It was much to my surprise that no one was interested in the solution to the century-old problem. It was as if Nikolaus Copernicus had approached the Ptolemaic Academy with a proposal to replace the geocentric system of the world with the heliocentric system. So let's talk about the essence of the discovery that I made in my late 20s. 
All physicists know how a standing wave is formed. The system must have either a source of oscillations and a mirror, or two in-phase sources of coherent waves. This implies that the velocity of the system in the wave medium must be equal to zero. But what happens to the standing wave if the system moves in the wave medium with a constant velocity? In such a system, according to the Doppler effect, the direct wave will be shorter and the return wave will become longer. At least in acoustics, this is exactly what happens. But taking this a step further, I will say that in a moving system, despite the fact that the counter waves have different lengths and widths, a standing wave will take place. However, in the longitudinal orientation to the direction of motion, the standing wavelength will change. In other words, it will become shorter by a factor of 1 minus beta squared. This effect has been given the term standing wave compression. The general formula is this. It follows from the formula that the greater the velocity of the system, the shorter the length of the standing waves realized in that system, a dependence experimentally confirmed by me in 1991 using acoustic waves. But let's go all the way back to 1881, to the period when Albert Michelson tried to discover the wave medium called the luminiferous ether. For this purpose, he created a device, which we now call the Michelson interferometer. The epic of Michelson's research ended miserably because he didn't find any clear confirmation of the Earth's movement in the ether. In order to save the situation, Lorenz took up focusing on the hypothesis of the reduction of the size of bodies moving in the ether. He tried to find this physical phenomenon which would behave exactly according to the predictions of the contraction hypothesis, but he was unable to do this. And now, a hundred years later, this phenomenon was found and the reason for Michelson's fiasco was understood. The year 1905 marked the appearance of the special theory of relativity, which was based on the postulate of the equality of the speed of light in all inertial systems. Until now, for many physicists, this postulate is considered to be a revelation from above, indisputable knowledge. However, none of those who believed in Einstein set up a simple experiment to determine the speed of light in only one direction. Adepts of Einstein believe that such an experiment is impossible in principle. I don't think so, so I propose to look into the problem. But hold on one second. First we propose to go back to the time and period before 1905, to a time when we know nothing about Einstein or his theory. This will allow us to remove the tacit ban on the analysis of the situation related to the problem of the experimental detection of the ether. We'll start with the way physics comes about the standard of length by means of Michelson's interferometer, and this will be considered in light of the Lorenz hypothesis regarding the reduction of the sizes of moving bodies. More on that in the next video of this series, so be sure to subscribe. <laughs>